Um, hi, I'm Gary Leslie. Welcome to Highland Park Schools Update. And once again, our guest is Highland Park School Superintendent, Dr. Scott Taylor. Thank you again for, again for doing this. Glad to be here. So let's uh, start right away with, uh, the, we know that we're having, that you're instituting this whole child movement mm -hmm. this, to address the whole child throughout. Sure. So could you give us a little bit of a description of what that means? So the whole child initiative came out of an organization that's well respected in our field called uh, the Association for Supervision and Curriculum Development, better known as ASCD. Uh, the idea is basically to see every child as more than just uh, a vassal, an empty vassal we can fill with knowledge, academic knowledge, but rather somebody who needs to feel good about him or herself, confidence, um, have strong interpersonal skills, um, have grit, tenacity, the recognition that um, working hard can help you overcome any of your deficiencies. So the school district developed um, a goal as part of our strategic plan that has us aligning a lot of what we're doing, changing, to address the needs of the whole child, not just the academic needs he or she has. And this is for the whole child from the beginning of their saga in the Highland Park school system? Uh -huh. Absolutely. Uh, you know, even for those three-year-olds, three-and-a-half-year-olds, who um, uh, family and children's services will refer to us who have special needs, special physical or uh, developmental needs, who enter our pre-K disabled program all the way through senior year, and in some cases, after senior year, we're responsible for um, all children up to the age of 21 who have uh, individual education plans, who have special needs. So in some cases, we're continuing to work with young adults who are and adults age um, all the way up to 21. So what is this, could you give an example? What, what would this mean to a child coming into the system now? And what would, what would a child expect um, in, in terms of the evaluation in this program? So... I think what um, the, the, the traditional way districts would uh, consider a child's baseline, you know, how is the, where is the child right now as a five-year-old kindergarten student, let's say, um, what was to uh, implement a battery of um, academic-related assessments, uh, looking for uh, the ability to perhaps read at that early age, if not how to decipher letters, um, how to make sense of numbers. What we're doing and other school districts that focus on the whole child are doing um, is taking stock of their confidence, their ability to uh, relate to other children, um, and, um, and what appears to be insecurities that we can hopefully turn around. And Ed, you're probably wondering how we do that. We don't have a test, but what we do is closely observe kids in play or in meetings that we'll establish with the kids, you know? So, uh, one of our strategies at the Irving school that we're using to foster, um, healthy, people, socially and emotionally, is called Responsive Classroom. Responsive Classroom uh, has all of our kids um, in grades K through five in what we refer to as a morning meeting that has kids sitting for about 20 minutes with their peers in a circle, greeting each other, talking with each other, one-to-one, -one, sometimes in triads or in groups of four. We use those times, especially at the early, early ages, pre-K and kindergarten, even first grade, to anecdotally consider where these kids place on the EQ scale, the emotional intelligence scale. You know, EQ is something that Howard Gardner up at Harvard made very well known. It's this idea that people can be smart academically, intellectually, that's IQ, um, but they also need to be smart socially and emotionally, that's EQ. So we, um, we're not implementing these batteries of assessments that we used to. So just a set, consider academic baseline. So, so these children, let's just stop there for a second. Yeah. These children that are in the early years and they're in these sessions where they're being observed how they, they how well or how they interact. Mm -hmm. So A, who is, I guess the first question is who's making that evaluation? Mm -hmm. Is it the teacher, somebody else that's trained? 
That's a great question. Our teachers are well, well trained in the, this area. They, are, they know what to look for. Um, we've spent a lot of time in, a, in the last four years uh, taking a look at um, the kinds of trauma that our kids bring to the table, um, the kind of um, social environments in, through which they're growing. Uh, it's a different time than when we grew up. Um, we're not digital natives. We're digital immigrants. The children we acquire from, you know, off the street into kindergarten are digital natives. They're, they're not accustomed to um, talking on a phone. They're accustomed to texting. Even at the age of five and five and six, our teachers have been trained over the last four years to understand how all of those um, influencers are impacting those kids and then what to look for if um, the kids have been negatively impacted by some of those influencing factors. You know, nature versus nurture, we, we probably studied that in our college days, the idea that kids come to us or people grow up um, genetically ordained in certain ways, but they're also impacted by, um, by nurture, by the things around them. We're better understanding how kids come to us nurtured certain ways. We also have, um, in case a teacher has a concern, and that reaches beyond his or her professional capability. We also have people on staff like mental health specialists, trained psycho psychologists who can step in and conduct their own observations of the kids. Are we talking about severe things where people, are, where children are... In some to, cases, yeah. Are we talking just about, well, this child doesn't seem to be able to relate to other children or as well as others or... So if after a week or two in September, um, our, our new crop of kindergartners, because we, we don't have a full day, full time pre-K program, so oftentimes we get kids for the first time in kindergarten. Um, if after the first couple of weeks, we see a kindergartner um, not playing appropriately with peers, not um, uh, using proper greetings with peers or talking properly with peers, we'll... Um, We'll call in a mental health specialist. We have two on staff in the K-5 grades and um, have that individual use actually a, 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 a real assessment tool, a very formal assessment tool that collects quantitative data, numerical data, not just qualitative data, not anecdotal mm -hmm. data. And um, we'll, we'll then potentially work with the parent, guardian, or bring concerns to a larger group that we call the INRS committee, the Intervention and Referral Services Committee. Mm -hmm. That's for another conversation. But that just gives you a snapshot of what, uh, of what interventions we have in place and how things could play out in the first couple of weeks of school as we try to focus on the whole child and diagnose what that child's needs are. And so I would assume, though, that, in, and we don't have to talk about the details right now, but I would assume that in that case, in those early years, that, that before there's this battery of evaluations, the parents would be called in and consulted and there would be some sort of discussion about it. In, in some cases. It all depends on the degree of uh, concern. Um, so we try not to alarm parents and guardians. We, we, we don't want to call a, a, kindergartner, a kindergartner's mom or dad or guardian and say, hey, I think we have a problem and it's the second week of school, so, particularly when we're often working with young parents who in some cases may, for the very first time, be sending a child off to school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's such a thing as the whole adult as much as there is the whole child. We want to be cognizant of our parents and guardians' social emotional needs too. So um, we, we, we wait. We wait until the time is right, and then we bring that, uh, that, that party in. But we try to do all of this work as early as we can so we can have all of our impl implementation strategies in place uh, intervention strategies in place before they get old enough that we can't rewire them, we can't recondition their potentially dysfunctional behaviors. So this program has just recently started? Uh, no. So the, pro so the programs have been in place for a couple of years. What's different now mm -hmm. is that we are taking a step back. And, um, and by the way, uh, if I may toot Highland Park's horn, we are being visited by numbers of districts, um, I can count at least six school districts that have so far since the beginning of the school asked to visit us 
to tour the schools and visit our programs. We just had a group from China, uh, five educators who flew in from China um, to, to, to do some work here in the States, but also to meet with me, uh, Tracy Maiden, our social emotional learning lab coordinator, Juliana Luxa, our dean of restorative practices at the upper grades, to learn about the strategies that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. What we're doing a better job of now, however, is taking stock of all the things we're doing at Irving, Bartle, the middle school and the high school, and vertically articulating them. By that I mean, um, if I don't use as you speak, simply seeing how they all, all these things work together and how kids can build what they learn from year to year upon prior <clears throat> knowledge and skills that they've learned. So we're talking about young children now, but we have the middle school, we have the high school. Uh, is there anything that addresses what, children that had not been, uh, uh, this, you said it was a, a couple of years this program sure. has been. So you have problems that are probably analogous in older children and older, older students. What do you do to well, And I'll tell you why. We also have a number of students who come every year from other school districts, in some cases from some pretty tough neighborhoods, inner city, you know, hardcore urban neighborhoods, experiencing some unfortunate but um, uh, typical, you know, hardcore urban problems. And, uh, and they, they come to us, they're 15, they're 16, all they knew were their adverse experiences. And so what we do is we intensify the support at the middle and high school teen center. We have a suite uh, of five offices staffed by three full-time social workers, and or two social workers and one um, a clinically trained psychologist. And uh, these folks, and besides them, of course, we have, some, we have some doctoral interns who work with us. But aside from them, the three full-time therapists provide the kind of therapy that you or me, or somebody we know who could afford to pay a therapist, or who has the, 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 re, the human capital, the human resources to go to a therapist, that kind of mental health support right here in the schools, two, three days a week. So essentially, we're providing what a lot of adults need um, on a, you know, a weekly basis, that's uh, you know, some good psychoanalysis for kids who come to us troubled. So is, is that, though, on a voluntary basis, that similar, that you're, there's, you observe a problem and then you suggest that they go through this? It's, well, yeah. I mean, look, we don't force kids to come to therapy. Uh, that's not going to work for either party. But we do a pretty darn good job persuading. And, and in some cases, you know, in some cases, we work closely with the, the uh, local police and um the local uh, Division of Child and Family Services uh, representatives to build into their, their own support programs. I mean, look, if you have a st student uh, who was caught up in some law legal matter or um, DCF, which was formerly known as DIFUS, more commonly known in the old days as DIFUS, had to uh, step in and, and intervene to support a family, sometimes we'll actually codify the therapy in their support plans, which in many ways compels the family to compel the, the child to, to take part in, uh, in counseling. So, you know, and we do a number of things to ease them into the process. You know, kids, look, there's still a stigma attached to therapy um, mm -hmm. for adults as well as for kids. Uh, we use a number of strategies to try to get kids to feel comfortable with the psychologist and the two social workers. Um, we have dogs three days a week that we use for therapy. Um, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Maisie, uh, Moose, and Bella run around the suite. They don't run. They, they're for older, so they, they, they crawl. They, they, they lurch around the suite. But um, on, on occasion, the therapist will um, have the, the student, the, uh, the client, pick the dog up, bring the dog into the session, and hold the dog, stroke the dog for the hour that they're meeting with the psychologist or the uh, so social worker. So it's, it's, it's something that's very rare to find in a lot of schools, and people who visit us wonder how we can afford it. How... Financially, we're fortunate. We have a, a, a pretty sizable grant from the state of New Jersey 
to help us, us in that area. But we've always built it into our budget for years and years. So it's just something that's been institutionalized. So let's let me go down a level here about other topics related to this whole child movement. This whole so thanks for asking. So I, it would probably be uh, the audience's um, best interest to learn about uh, two new things that have uh, cropped up and um, have caused some consternation among residents. But um, we've worked through with both those who have had concerns about these things and, and those who support them. Um, the two things I'm going to uh, share with you have to do with how we are supporting our, our uh, LGBTQ and uh, transgender population and uh, what we're doing to narrow the academic achievement gap uh, by uh, detracking uh, our math program early on at the middle school. So um, the, the whole child means not just focusing on his or her social emotional uh, wellness, but also, as I pointed out earlier, um, ability to perform in, in a certain way so that we build confidence in, in that child. And uh, in order to do that, um, it's really important that we give all of our kids the same opportunities to be exposed to the same kind of rigorous curricula that we have been exposing our highest achievers um, for years. We have a real uh, problem with the uh, numbers of our disenfranchised kids, and, and many of whom happen to be Hispanic, black, and classified with special needs and the Caucasian and Asian students in our uh, uh, student body. Uh, there's a wide academic achievement gap. This also happens to be a, a wide gap in the way we are handling discipline when it comes to these different groups. Uh, and um, in order to, to help narrow the gap and also focus on our disenfranchised students' um, need to be able to build confidence, academic confidence, we're going to be merging a couple of our math tracks in sixth grade starting in 2020, 2021. Now, it doesn't mean we're lowering the bar for the highest, highest achievers. What it does mean is we're actually raising the bar for the, uh, what had been the lower achievers, partly because they never had the opportunity to be exposed to the same rigorous curricula as their high achieving peers. We're actually raising that bar and to, um, as we merge the two groups and the two levels that we currently have in the, in the sixth grade math program, as we do that, we recognize if we're going to raise the bar, we have to provide additional academic supports for these kids. And we're doing that by um, changing the curricula. We've already begun to teach math in a different way in the fourth and fifth grade, even though we're not talking about doing this until next year, because it's the fifth grade group that'll be entering that sixth grade, teaching, needing that extra jump. Teaching math in a different way, meaning what? Meaning, meaning different subject matter, different um, No, so subjects? actually we're, we're leveraging um, the, the, the benefit of being so close to Rutgers University and having so many residents who work at the university by bringing in um, Professor Dan Batty. Dan Batty is a resident of Highland Park and also have, happens to be a leading researcher at Rutgers and in the nation on this very topic, how to um, narrow the achievement gap, build students' academic confidence by detracting, but doing it without having to lower standards, lower the bar for the highest achievers. And so what he has been helping us do is change our delivery of instruction through the curricula. So we're not actually using a different textbook, we're not using different um, manipulatives, different materials, but we're teaching in a much more individualized matter. We, we're using a, uh, a methodology called complex instruction. And those at home who want to learn more about it can Google complex instruction. And we'll see that um, <clears throat> the approach comes out of Stanford University initially, but is now spreading to um, help schools like us, uh, starting at the elementary level, even if they're going to be detracting at the higher grades level, prepare the kids who are going to go up into those merge classes, be successful. So we're not doing this hodgepodge, um, and we're doing it over time. It's taking us three years to get to this point. But just so that, just to be clear, there's, uh, that in the fifth grade, which we're preparing these students to be in this more rigorous program in the sixth, I would assume that that would mean that the fifth grade would be also be more rigorous. Uh, 
not necessarily. Uh, so it has been. Let's, let's just say it's not more rigorous. It always has been rigorous. We have, uh, we teach track the Bartle School, our grades two to five leveled math program, uh, five, five years ago. We used to have tracks. We merged those classes. What was happening was when the kids in fifth grade would go to sixth grade, they would be slotted in these different tracks, often based on the results of a single standardized test that we would give them, nothing else, uh, or little else. I mean, sometimes we would get uh, uh, teacher input. Um, and they, so essentially, they would fall off a cliff. They'd go from fifth grade, having worked with their peers, learned with their peers, all of a sudden to being separated. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so it's not necessarily a change in the rigor as it is a change in how we are personalizing instruction to a much greater extent here. So we, we, we it hit those kids' remedial needs right now. And one other thing I should add, we hired this year a part-time basic skills teacher just for math. So those kids who just don't get it can get extra help by being pulled out. From and is that what you, just to be, it, when you say personalized skills, you mean tutoring? Do you mean additional aid? No. So um, I'll give you a for instance of what this looks like. Uh, so I was, just, I was in a, a second grade classroom that's also adapting this approach down at the lower grades. Mm -hmm. I walked into the classroom. There were five groups of students in a math class, um, groups of uh, three. I think there was a class of roughly 15, all engaged in different activities. One was actually playing a, a math board game. Another group was um, um, uh, using uh, dominoes to um, engage in um, math equations or construct and then deconstruct math equations. Another group was working, and this is a group of three kids, was working with the teacher for about 50, 20 minutes um, in a crescent-shaped a crescent shaped desk. The teacher was sitting here. The kids were, were like, uh, surrounded around the teacher. And she was, she grouped the kids, by the way, according to their skill needs. She was providing them individualized instruction that she can't provide all 15 kids at the same time based on those three kids' particular needs while the other kids were very independently working on their own, building on their skills. 20 minutes later, she rotated those stations, so she met with another group of three and addressed that, their needs, different needs, but their needs. That's what that looks like. That's what personalized instruction looks like. And that wasn't happening in math. For, for the longest time. It was happening in literacy, but not so much in math. So now we're saying that in the sixth grade, we'll, they'll have the benefit of that experience, right? And that, they'll have grown up in that experience all the way through fifth grade in a more um, uh, uh, structured way, in a more structured way, so that when they hit sixth grade, uh, by the sixth grade, they'll be working with their peers and the teacher will have been trained in similar strategies might not look quite the same as it did at Bartle, but but very similar. And so this is a, I know you say that this has been going on in the fifth grade for a while, but this is a fairly new approach to... to uh, well, the approach I just described is fairly new. It took, took root about two years ago. Uh, complex instruction is, is much like what I just shared with you, mm -hmm. but on a, on a more um, complex scale. And that, that's, that's new. That's happening uh, in fourth and fifth grade. So what benchmarks do you have that you're going to be looking at other than the actual you know the actual the, the actual test scores and things like that are you going to be measuring things along the way yes so what we're anticipating um, is well there w look, there is no doubt we will narrow the achievement gap and and whether I like it or not the what used to be the park assessment which is now the New Jersey State Learning, uh, uh, Student Learning Assessment, the NJSLA, um, will show a different change. I mean, we, I, I'm not a b big believer in the authenticity of that data, but look, if I have to compare that to previous scores, I'll probably see a positive change. What I think will be more telling um, it are the results we see when those sixth graders in 2020, 2021 become seventh graders and eighth graders and ninth graders, as their teachers tell us how better prepared they are to tackle the more rigorous curricula that they're going to uh, 
be exposed to each grade higher. Now, keep in mind, you know, when, when back in the day when you and I were in school, there was a uh, there was a track. You know, you, you took something in sixth and seventh and eighth grade, and then you hit high school, and you took algebra, geometry, algebra two, precalculus, calculus. We have a similar trajectory. What we are anticipating, what we're hoping, what we'll measure is the, traje the trajectory of these kids coming out of 2021's version of sixth grade math. It'd be nice to see them hit, all hit the same tra trajectory, which would, by the way, be they go on to um, uh, algebra or perhaps geometry in ninth grade, and they end having taken calculus by senior year, if they choose to go, go that route. We're, we're not gonna suggest that every kid's a mathematician, mm -hmm. but we'd like to see at least them have the ability, the capacity to take that higher level math. Okay, so besides detracking, uh, one of the other elements that we had been talking about, about this whole child assessment, is had to do with, well, bathrooms, right? And, and maybe you can talk about that. The old bathroom debate. So, uh, you know, bathrooms are a touchy subject in, uh, in schools lately. Um, so we are um, also known for our pioneering efforts to support kids who transition gender or who identify as um, non-binary. They don't identify as uh, a male or a female. The next logical step for us was to continue to normalize the environment for a sizable population of students who identify as transgender or um, LGBTQ or, or, or um, non-binary. Uh, and that, that was including the shift of some of our bathrooms to become all gender bathrooms. It's very, it's very popular. I was just in Atlantic City last week for a conference. And in the Atlantic City Co um, Conference Center were a number, well, actually there was one all gender bathroom. But it was very clear, very clearly marked. I had never seen it before. Um, so this is a trend in both the private and the public sector. What we've decided to do here at Bartle School, because we have a number of students who identify as transgender or non-binary, is convert one of the uh, three girls' bathrooms to become an all-gender bathroom. So it's a multi-stall bathroom that is now an all-gender bathroom. Multi-stall meaning that anybody can go in. Uh, and that there are multiple toilets, or if we convert a boys' bathroom, that would be urinals. Uh, right now, we've just converted a girls' bathroom, so that means there are two toilets with um, privacy walls. That's a, that's a relatively new thing for schools. How recent is, is that for you? How, how recent is that for you? Uh, how did it go? No, well, well, that's a separate question. But how recently has that changed? Well, so that happened uh, two weeks ago. Oh. Uh, no, I'm sorry, three weeks ago from the date that we're talking. We have a phase two. Phase a phase two. two is going to be to convert a bathroom downstairs. We have two floors. So let me ask, I mean, the inevitable question is, how is this going? It, what's the reaction, first from students and also from parents, because right. they might not be exactly the same? So... At first, we, there were parents, not a lot, but some, and they were vocal, expressed concerns about this. And uh, concerns were over the potential awkwardness the child might experience when walking into a bathroom and seeing a child who's biologically the opposite gender but identifies as that other child's gender. Also, had a, I've heard, heard concerns about... Um, potential assault in, in the bathrooms as a result of, you know, biological boys, biological girls mingling. Um, but, um, but you know what, first of all, we haven't had those issues since we opened up this bathroom, nor have I recorded or have I re researched or found any um, such instances anywhere that in the country, I mean, based on my, my internet searches and, and by talking with colleagues. Um, so, after we had those concerns voiced, we tried to address them, we moved forward. I haven't heard those concerns since. And I, I think what, we're, what we saw, which is similar to what we saw three years ago when we implemented our progressive, at that time, very progressive gender identity support policy. You might recall, we got a lot of press for that, national press. Um, back then we had 
concerns expressed vocally as well. We held a forum at the high school three years ago before we implemented the policy. A lot of people came out. A lot of people were angry. Um, but after the policy was implemented, just as the case here, after we converted the uh, multi-stall bathroom to be all gender, things got quiet. Things were, got norm were normalized. They, look, we didn't just do this. Yeah. We had meetings with the kids. We had meetings with the teachers. And, of course, meetings with the parents. I was going to add, because the, uh, the students' attitude towards this, I mean, they're, they're, kids are a little bit more worldly-wise about stuff like this than they were when I was a kid, but just trying to, trying to get an assessment for what their reaction so, was to this. So, uh, admittedly, I botched the initial rollout in early September. Um, I did not do a good enough job communicating the change to the children, to the students. So that those first few days were confusing for some of the kids who came home and I was told by their parents had questions about which bathroom to use, what they should do. But when I recognized my mistake, I um, quickly contacted an organization called High Tops that specializes in working with kids uh, through these things. And, um, and then we, uh, we, we took a couple of steps back, um, a breather, and then uh, we initiated the, the whole process brought the kids back into a whole, what we call a whole school meeting, had a meeting with them, which um, we did only after being coached by this organization called High Tops, H-I-T-O-P-S, based in Princeton. And since then, I think we've, um, we've clarified questions that they've had, and, uh, and there doesn't seem to be any confusion. Now, mind you, that there, there are many other op uh, options for kids to use bathrooms associated with their gender. So, mm -hmm. uh, look, in this school we have uh, three boys' bathrooms and three girls' bathrooms. Right now we've only taken one girls' bathroom out of the mix and converted that one into an all-gender bathroom. Okay. Now, is there, before we move on to just another subject, is there anything else that you want to cover in terms of this whole child? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, you know, I touched on the, the need for us to focus on the social-emotional wellness of these kids and and how we're doing that, thanks to the strategies that I mentioned at Irving, all the way up to the work we're doing at the Teen Center. And, um, and, and I do feel that the efforts to narrow the equity gap by detracking and to focus on supporting kids like those who are um, identifying as transgender or non-conforming, all will help us help grow the whole child, not just, the, not, not just that single part of the child. What should we be looking for in the next coming months? What, what developments do you think that we should be paying attention to? Uh, so, um, we're, so there are actually a couple of things on the horizon, uh, one of which is for us to um, emphasize on a curriculum level play-based learning at our Irving School, Early Childhood School. We just received cases of blocks, of play blocks that we're distributing to teachers. We're, we're trying to double down on our efforts to um, to expand play-based learning. So when we meet again, I hope to have an update for you in that area. Uh, we're also, um, in the next couple of months, going to be expanding on something that I'd love to talk more about when next we meet, and that is our OWL period at the middle school. We have 54 students who have taken a leadership role in the area of implementing restorative practices. And uh, we've seen our discipline rates at the middle school plummet as a result already of uh, not only of the leadership role the kids are taking, but the fact that we're in our fourth year of implementing restorative practices. So in two months, I'm going to have even more data to show the public, I think, that uh, proves that this is working, that restorative practices is working. So this is just a couple of things to whet your appetite that I'll, uh, I'll circle back to when we meet again. Well, we'll look forward to that. And I, I think that that's, this has been a great informative session. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And thank you very much.